tell you all, I can't preach like she plays. <laughs> right. um, but we're going to pick up our study in Revelation, which has us in Revelation chapter 6. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, uh, well, it's, about, it's about to get rocky, y'all. We're, we're, we're about to get into some of the serious parts of the study. And uh, some hard parts, really, if I can put it that way. And some parts where a lot of good Christians have disagreement. And I think you should allow for that somewhat. We should have agreement on the major doctrines. I can only present it the best that I understand it. And uh, as I went through the text, and uh, I went through it many times... Uh, I laid it out and I could not come up with an introduction to this. I would just remind you of everything that has taken place leading up to this. I think typically a preacher is supposed to give an introduction to, to catch your attention. But here we are talking about the ushering in of the four horsemen of the end times. I think everyone is familiar with this. Uh, in fact, most non-Christian people in our culture are familiar with this. And uh, so... The only introduction I'll offer you is to tell you that I don't work for you. <laughs> Some of y'all might think that I do, but um, I'm going to have to stand before God. I'm going to have to answer for how I present His Word, including these prophecies that are most difficult. And so uh, I just hope you'll bear that in mind. And, uh, let's read through this. We will take the text, all of chapter 6, which is 17 verses. We're going to take it piece by piece, and we're just going to look at the text at first, which is... Like I said, there's a lot here. In verse 1 it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth, conquering, and to conquer. So, this is the opening of the first of the seven seals. I'll remind you that uh, you see the beast is the one that says come and see. Uh, it is my best understanding that this beast somehow is a picture or somehow represents the church. One of the differences that you see among teachers and theologians is that many think that these are some type of an angel. And in, in fact, they have a strange description. But I will remind you that it says that they said with the elders of the land that he has redeemed us by his blood. So I, I believe that they picture the church somehow. And so here, the Lamb is the one. Remember, the Lamb is the only one that can open the seals of the title deed to the earth. And so he opens them. And what we are going to see come forth are many judgments. Now some of you might be thinking, well, if it's the title deed, why are judgments coming forth? Well, you see, this earth is covered in wickedness. And those that hate God, that are in rebellion against God, or have apathy towards God, that want none of God. And God must judge sin. He Amen. must judge wickedness. And as we covered last time, that judgment has been given to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And He will judge. And He will judge in truth and righteousness. And here it says that when He opens the seals, the first seal... It says, And behold, a white horse and him that sat on him had a bow. Now listen, everybody knows that the hero is the one that comes riding in on the white horse. And so when you read this, you may be tempted to say, Well, here comes a hero. But it says that he has a bow in his hand, which is indeed a weapon of warfare or something uh, designed to picture that. And it says that a crown is given to him. But by the way, this is not just any crown. This is a victor's crown. We'll get to that in a minute. And it says that he is going forth, conquering, and to conquer. So he is indeed a savior type. But I'm going to submit to you that this pictures the Antichrist coming in in a sort of power and glory. Now you may not like that sound, but it is clear that the whole world is going to worship him. That he's going to be raised up not as the president of the United States, not as the leader of the United Nations, but as a world ruler. And so he is going to be something like the world has never seen. Whatever charisma Adolf Hitler had that caused so many to follow after him, in this man it will be greater. It will be magnified. He will have words that people want to hear. And by the way, 
this crown that's given to him, I looked it up, and in the Greek it refers specifically to a victor's crown. It's not, uh, well, we're going to see Jesus, the true Savior, come in on a white horse later in Revelation. And it says that he has many crowns or diadems. And these are the crowns of royalty. But this particular crown that we see here is a crown that is a victor's crown. So it is one that has been given to him for being something. Now listen, people in this day and age that we live, they somewhat worship other people. We see this in sports athletes. We see this in celebrities. And, and by the way, the worst and most ridiculous of all of those are, are movie actors that play someone. They just pretend, and people fall in love with their characters, and they sort of worship the people as, a, as an effect of that. Now, why is that? I have no idea. But these people enjoy a certain place in society. They are some of the richest among us. Uh, they are certainly the most sought-after people. will hide in dark alleys to take pictures of them. But uh, this, this word... Uh, bow that you see here um, it has one occurrence in the Greek in all of the New Testament and it's right here, only the New Testament that was written in Greek, the Old Testament was of course written in Hebrew, but I went to uh, the Septuagint, if you look at the Septuagint, uh, this is by the way, the Septuagint is the Old and New Testament in its Greek and the word bow is in there many times, but one of those places is where God makes a, the Noahic covenant he makes his covenant with Noah and it says he set his bow in the sky. And this obviously refers to a rainbow. And so I believe, in fact, you look at the many references, this bow does indeed refer to a bow as in a bow and arrow, but it could also be symbolic of a covenant. And one of the reasons I would suggest that is what it says about the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 9. You can go look at this in your own time if you wish, but it says that he will make a covenant. This is in the 70th week of Daniel. And then he will make a covenant primarily with Israel, and then he will break that covenant. And so I believe this may picture the Antichrist coming in with his bow in hand, his covenant. And by the way, him conquering and going forth to conquer does not necessarily mean warfare, not at first. In fact, it says that he will come in the name of peace, and he is going to do most of his conquering beforehand. The war comes later. In fact, we'll read about that in just a moment. I will remind you that of these many judgments that are being poured out that are going to take place, it says... In one of the epistles to those at Thessalonica, that they will be like labor pains. Now, the women in here can probably understand this better than us men, but what you know about labor pains is you don't have a labor pain, and then that one goes away, and then you get a different one. They build, and it grows, and it increases intensity. So do not read this as this seal happens, and then it stops, and this seal opens, and this happens. And it's, it's increasing and growing and building on itself. And that is how... We will, we will view all of the judgments that we see in Revelation as we move from the seals uh, to the trumpets and to the vials or bowls of judgment. They are all increasing and growing. So, that brings us to the second seal. And if you'll look in verse 3, it says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was, listen to this, Given unto him, power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So we see that this is the war horse. And by the way, horses in Scripture always uh, indicate power and, 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 and strength. And here we see that uh, the Antichrist has come in on his white horse being presented as a savior type. And now we see a red horse. Do not mistake this and say well, this definitely means a different ruler. It doesn't say that. This could be the very same guy. In fact, when I'm reading it, I'm reading that this is the same guy, but now he takes on a new tactic. In fact, after he breaks the covenant, he brings about warfare. And by the way, uh, if you can picture this as a sort of a political thing and, and imagine it unfolding, if you set up a kingdom and people start to rebel against it, then war will surely follow. And by the way, such can be witnessed even today in communist countries or in days that have just uh, shortly passed by. But it, I want to point out, it says power was given to him. That is the case here, and that is always the case, that ultimately God is in control. Amen. God is in control. It says that the power was given to him, that he's taking peace. And so peace, whatever can be found of peace on earth, is gone. And it's going to be wars. In fact, uh, 
We'll read some numbers in a minute, but it says that they will kill each other. And it even mentions a great sword. This is a picture of warfare, of death, an implement of destruction and killing. And by the way, don't mistake this to mean that it's all going to be hand-on-hand -hand combat, okay? Uh, I, it's not been that long ago. I used to read Revelation or some of the uh, apocalyptic literature that's found in our own New Testament, and I would say, well, what kind of technology is going to arise such that guns don't work anymore? And I would ponder on that. What kind of, how could that possibly work? Remember, this is symbology. This is symbols that were given to John in a day and age when they didn't have guns and tanks and that sort of thing to, to paint a picture, all right? So when it says a great sword, just understand that to be weapons of warfare, okay? And the third seal is open. In, five, in verse 5, it says, When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, this black horse, again, picturing power, being that it is a horse, it is black. Now, uh, if you use some version other than the King James, you might miss many references. And by the way, I'm not saying that it's better. Uh, but you might miss some of the references to blackness. And black is a picture, or excuse me, a color that goes along with famine. It goes along with starvation and hardship and oppression. And so when we see this black horse, it is automatically symbolic of famine. If you don't get that, he has uh, the rider has a set of balances in hand. He's going to set the price for the food that you eat. Now, that should be a little bit scary. Right now, the price is set by supply and demand, at least mostly, okay? But when it says a measure of wheat for a penny, now, if we read that in English, we'll say, oh, well, that's a, that's a good price right there. That's better than, no. A penny here is a denarius. It's a day's wage. So if you want to eat a crust of bread just to keep yourself going for another day, you have to work an entire day to get one loaf of bread or one quart of wheat. And by the way, I'm not sure that uh, this is exaggerating when it says that it is unprocessed. It's not bread, it's wheat. I believe that you may just get the grain and right. you may have to deal with it yourself at that point. Now you can get a little more if you're willing to take the barley. And uh, I'm going to tell you guys, anybody in here eating barley this week? No. I don't think we eat barley. We feed that to animals. But I'm going to tell you what, for the people that have families, they can either choose to have one loaf of bread or they can have a little more if they're willing to eat what the critters eat. This is not good. This picture is a famine. In fact, I want to give you some of those references to blackness. And, and by the way, this is not a racial thing. This has nothing to do with black people. In fact, this referred to the Israelites who are not a black people. So when it says blackness, this is just a painted picture. And this is what it says in Jeremiah 14. Uh, concerning the dearth. It says, Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languisheth. They are black unto the ground. The cry of Jerusalem has gone up. In Lamentations, it says, Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. The idea here is that you would look on someone who is starving as if they were just black and sunk in. It is a, a languishing look. Joel 2, 6 it says, Before the face of the people shall be much pain, all faces shall gather blackness. Now, most of the other versions of the Bible, uh, they have translated those uh, as are very hungry or want for much, things like that. Um, I'm just reading it to you. The literal are black. And the idea here is that black indicates famine. Now, we've seen an antichrist come in, no doubt elected by the people. People wanted him. He's solving some kind of great world problem, bringing some sort of peace. I can't imagine how else people would want to set up a one ruler for all the earth. Uh, who knows? Maybe he's going to uh, make us all healthy so that we never get sick. He's going to promise prosperity to all people. Uh, he's going to solve the problems of pollution in the world. I'm not kidding. I went to a meeting a while back that I was invited to. I was told to drive up there, and they had all these. And I got there, and they said, would you like to buy, uh, a, uh, give us some money so we can plant a tree for the carbon credits that you use driving up here. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the world has gone crazy on environmentalism. Uh, I kept my money. They can plant their own tree if they want to, okay? Now, I'm not saying that I believe in throwing trash out on the road, but this is a disposable earth, and it's here to be used, all right? So we use it, we steward it well, 
but nevertheless, I believe that the environmental movement has some pretty terrifying components of it. All right? Some people worship this earth. And so uh, he breaks his covenant, war breaks out, and with war comes famine, and this is often the case. Perhaps you've read of the food lines that uh, occurred during World War II. Or maybe you've read about this own country when it had its civil war and people burned the crop fields to starve their enemies. With war comes many sickening things, and one of those is famine. It could even be that food supplies are intentionally cut off. Most of you would be aghast if you knew how much of our food came from overseas, from other countries. Nevertheless, there's going to be a great shortage. And by the way, I will tell you, I'm not really sure what it means when it says, don't hurt the oil and the wine. You know, these are not like wheat. These, I, I, I look at them as luxuries. So maybe it means you can't have these things. They're reserved for some other people. Or maybe it means you've got a little bit, but you better not be wasteful with it. I really don't know. But the point is that there's going to be much want. If there, we are spoiled, rotten, rich in this country. The poorest of us are spoiled, rotten, rich. We do not do without. Right. But according to this, the days will come when men will barely have enough to get through the day. All right. Pastor, question, Pastor. Is this when the tribulation is starting? We're going to get to that. Oh, Bear right. with me. I'm, I'm just going to so, uh, with the fourth seal, it says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of a great beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, or that word is chloros, maybe a pale green horse or an ashen horse. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell, or Hades, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. You see, this is all building. Uh, there's war, there's famine, and by the way, it says that there's pestilence. Now, maybe, maybe this uh, indicates some sort of biological warfare. Maybe it indicates uh, just the state of things. When the world is in rubble, there's poor sanitation, waters are polluted, people aren't looking after themselves. There is no health care. We barely have enough to eat. I'm not sure. But the point is that there is some type of sickness that is coming. And by the way, it says one-fourth of all the people that are on earth at this time. And uh, to answer that question, I do not believe that the church will be there. This is the beginning of what is known as the tribulation, but not the great tribulation. Amen. The tribulation is a period of seven years. Right. But the great tribulation is the second half of that. And it will be a time such as has never been seen before. It's not just a judgments being executed because men hate each other, but God himself will pour out judgments Amen. upon the earth. This begins the, tri the tribulation right here. Now we're going to deal next time when we come back with what, what we think is going on with the church. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you ahead of time, I believe the church is raptured out beforehand. Can I prove it absolutely 100%? But I can come real close. I think I can create a compelling argument. And so I'm going to submit that to you. If you disagree with me, I love you. You are my brother and sister in Christ. You're just not as close to the Lord as I am. <laughs> there are many people that believe that the rapture occurs at other times, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. Many. And, uh, and by the way, there's some people that think that it's all figurative. And, uh, and I'm going to expose you to some of those beliefs and those ideas, and you're going to have to be discerning enough to, to sort through them yourself. But I, I'm going to spend the most time on the view that I believe is the best. And one of the reasons I believe is the best is it's the simplest. Uh, generally speaking, the easiest explanation is the right one. This is a law of science called the law of parsimony, or Occam, Occam's razor. It is what you think it is. That's how I read God's Word. That's how I interpret His Word. And so, yes, this is the tribulation. This is the fourth seal open. A quarter of the earth dying. World War III, or excuse me, World War, that would be World War III. World War II was the deadliest conflict in the history of humankind that we are aware of. And it killed approximately 3% of the earth's population. <clears throat> this one right here, at today's population with a quarter of the earth, it would be somewhere close to 2 billion people. Getting real close to it. This is not some small thing and it's not something like the world has ever seen before. And they will die from war, starvation, and by the way, it says the beasts of the earth. Now, I don't know what that means, but uh, I believe that we live in the day and age where maybe we could speculate that it doesn't refer to lions running the streets and eating people. It could be that these are the smallest beasts on earth. 
things like viruses and bacteria, the pestilences that it mentioned that are coming. So I'm not going to make any doctrine out of that. It's just something for you to somewhat consider that viruses and bacteria are indeed living things and therefore could be called beasts or zoo creatures, if you will. Now, this uh, black horse, and he has his balances in hand. Uh, I believe that it is not even supply and demand that will determine what people get, but it is the government, in this case, world government. I believe that uh, the Savior type, the Antichrist as he is called, uh, although John does not use that term in this book, um, he is called by many names, by the way, the beast in some places, the Assyrian elsewhere. But eventually he will even, and we'll get to this, he will even cause all the people, both small and great and rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark of the beast on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now, there is much conjecture about this mark. Is it an actual mark? Is it a barcode? Is it a tattoo? Is it a digital implant? Is it a credit card? Is it a cell phone? I've heard every sort of crazy theory that you can think of. But I would remind you that in Deuteronomy, in the Shema, it's, it says that the people of God will have the law of God on the frontlets of their eyes, that is on their head, and bound about their right arm. And there are Orthodox Jews that to this day, they take that and in a box and they bind it about their forehead and then they wrap it around their arm. They're doing a very literal thing, which what I think in most conservative Christians would say, it means keep the law of God at the forefront of your mind. So that in whatever you do with your right hand, most of the world is indeed right-handed, whatever you do is directed by what's on your mind, and that should be the Lord. So there may not be a literal physical mark, but perhaps there is. And indeed, with the technologies that we have today, and the things that are going on, the times are right for people to receive such a mark. It will be a law, not a choice. The people will not have a choice. If they want to buy or sell or eat, if they want to go out in public, if they want to do things, they must have this mark. You are not free if you don't have it. In fact, you're not free if you do have the mark. The mark brings about everlasting damnation. The scriptures are clear about that. Now listen, the, uh, the pale horse coming after him, it shows what such a... By the way, this all started with the promise of peace. This all started with a savior light coming in, and it is leading to destruction, to a quarter of the world dying. And eventually the fifth seal here is open, and it says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Dwell on the earth. This is a certain group of people that we're going to key in on as we move through this study. The earth dwellers. Them that dwell on the earth. And white robes were given unto every one of them. So you know that they're those that are covered by the righteousness of Christ. Amen. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season. In other words, be patient, all you who have been martyred. Be patient, and this is what he tells them, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now that's a pretty creepy uh, prophecy right there because what it is, it is God saying that there are some of you that will yet be killed. We're going to read about some of them moving forward very specifically, the two witnesses, for example. But I want you to know that there are people, and I know that we think that we're persecuted in the church today when people think that we're idiots because we believe in God in an increasingly atheistic world. We think we're persecuted because people uh, won't elect God-fearing, actual biblical Christians to public office anymore. We think we're persecuted. Amen. We know nothing of persecution. Amen. They are shutting down Christian churches in China this week. They're telling them to tear down their crosses. They don't want to see pictures of Jesus. And they're telling them to leave the church and worship the God that is government of big communism. That's persecution. In Saudi Arabia, they kill people for being Christian. They drag them out to public places and bring their kids to watch them be beheaded. And say, this is what happens to those who follow after Jesus. The days of such persecution are coming. Amen. The witnesses, the martyrs that I believe we see here are those that wake up one day and they see a whole bunch of people that they knew gone. The church having been raptured out before this happens because we as the church have a living hope, a lively hope, and one without judgment. We have been spared from judgment because Jesus Christ, he took our judgment. 
He bore our sins on the cross and there took the wrath of God upon him. Now, is God going to put the wrath of God on his son and then again put it on me? No. I don't think so. Right. So here the church is gone, but there will become there will be people that become Christians during the days of the tribulation. Amen. It will be those who take up Bibles in their hands. When they see all these things taking place, and they're going to say, the word of God is indeed true. They will not take the mark, and they will be killed for it. They will be martyred for it in all countries. And such are the tribulation saints. The sixth seal will be open. It says, and I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. This is not some of the worst earthquakes that we have seen in California or Japan or other places. This is a great earthquake. But there is a greater one that is coming. And it says, And the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth as a fig tree cast up her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and great men and rich men and the chief captains and mighty men and every bondman and every free man, I think you can say all of them, they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Hide us from God Almighty Amen. and from the wrath of the Lamb. For great, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand it? Who? You see, we're going to read this unfold and there are going to be men of this earth, sons of, of Adam, born of women, just people, and they're going to take up arms to do war against God Almighty and Jesus Christ His Son. Here when we see this earthquake, and it says you, and by the way, if you've uh, ever done much the way of prescribed burning, then perhaps you have seen smoke rise such that it blackens out the sun. You can look right at it in the, in the middle of the day. And that same smoke, it will settle to the earth when the uh, sun sets, you know that smoke sinks, but there'll be enough that it just sort of turns the moon blood red or orange or pink. It, 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 it changes its light. So it, that could be what's happening with this great earthquake and volcanic activity. And who knows what weapons of warfare, of bombs, and of entire cities burning. This is like something that we can scarcely imagine. That could be the case. Or perhaps it is indeed something completely and totally supernatural. Amen. That God Almighty Himself will blacken the sun. This very scripture is spoken of uh, elsewhere. And uh, let me see if I wrote it down here. In Matthew 24, 29, which by the way, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 24 and 25, every one of you should read it this week. It directly parallels what we're dealing with. It says, Amen. immediately after the tribulation of those days... Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something. You don't have to believe me. But the stars of heaven, or the stars generally, often refers to angels. Amen. Just like elsewhere, uh, we're going to see this throughout Revelation, that mountains, if we've read about mountains, they're all going to be shaken out of their place. Mountains are going to fall. They often refer to kingdoms, or uh, if you will, countries. Places that the kings rule and reign. We're going to be uncracking that a little bit later, but it's, it's, it's decoded for you. You don't have to read into it or, or attend some loosey-goosey school of theology. It's right there. decodes itself. And uh, so when this uh, earthquake takes place, whether it's something supernatural or just pictures the smoke rising from an earth being judged, it even goes on to say that heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. Now what does that mean? I cannot picture it. I've tried. And I don't quite know what to picture, but I do know that it says the stars will fall. Now, I want you to know that the scriptures say, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. And you almost get the picture of a burning meteor that falls to earth. And indeed, it could be that meteors will be rained upon the earth. It's kind of reminiscent of some Old Testament passages where brimstone and fire falls to the earth, right? And so these stars that come down, they could be indeed stars, or they could even be angels of destruction like those that were sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, which also was rained down upon with brimstone and fire. And by the way, the people that have taken their part and made their place here on the earth, the dwellers of the earth, they will have the fate of the one in that story who lingered and looked back 
and was turned as a pillar of salt. So these are great and terrible things, fearful things. And it says that they will hide in the dens and the rocks and the mountains. This could, I told you that mountains are emblematic of kingdoms. This could picture people calling out to the different governments, by the way, that are all uh, been subsumed by this new world leader to say, protect us, help us. Or it could just be very little. People hiding from any little crack that they can find from the wrath of God Almighty. So, a lot here. But I want to say this. It speaks of the day of the Lord. Or the great day of the wrath of the Lord. And by the way, specifically from the wrath of the Lamb. It is the Son of God who died on a cross at Calvary as a Lamb slain before the foundation of the world that He will return as the line of the tribe of Judah to execute the judgment of God. Amen. Justly and righteously. Amen. So, what are we to make of this? As I mentioned to you, when I pointed out that power was given unto them, these things that will take place that are brought about by men of the earth, power was given unto them, and a great sword was given unto him, and he had a pair of bounces in his hand. God lets this take place. Let me be, let me be a little bit firmer here. God causes it to take place. He gives them this power. I want to read you a verse from the Old Testament. Perhaps I've read it to you before. This is what it says. It says in Isaiah, you can look this up in chapter 10 later, it says, Without me they shall bow down under the prisoners. And they shall fall under the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away. But his hand is stretched out still. Now listen to what God says. O oh, Assyrian, the rod of my anger. This country, this king that he is going to use to bring about justice and judgment. So that his people will turn to him and repent. O oh, Assyrian, rod of my anger. And the staff in their hand is mine indignation. It is my wrath. I will send him against the hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now listen to what God says about the king that's going to do this. This is for all you people that think God has the power to see the future but not have his hand in it. It says, how be it? He meaneth not so. So the king doesn't even want to do this. It's not his plan. The Assyrian, the rod of God's anger, the one that he's using... And then he says, neither doth his heart think so. He hasn't even dreamed it up that this is what he's going to do. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. So God is going to, and by the way, God judges him for doing that. Yeah. And the Antichrist is going to do this work of God. He's going to bring about the beginning of these judgments, the first of the birth pains that are increasing. And then God's going to judge him for it. Amen. He will have his place in the lake of fire. So... God is bringing them about. Well, I'll remind you of what Joseph told his brothers. What you meant, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. Amen. You know what? It's hard for us to see these apocalyptic things when each and every one of us knows that we are guilty sinners. Yeah. And that we deserve what they are getting except that by grace we have been saved Amen. by the blood of the Lamb. Right. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. And the church's job is to make that message known. That by the blood of the Lamb you can be saved if Amen. you will but believe. Amen. These are those that would not. That's the way that Jesus says it. How often I would have gathered you under my wings like a chick with her, or a chicken gathers her chicks, but you would not. Yeah. And so he sent them to the highways and to the hedges to bid those that were not invited to the wedding. And even us Gentile dogs get to come to the Amen. wedding feast of the Lamb. Listen, I'm going to give you another doctrine. The first one, God is in control. God is sovereign. He is completely Lord always and forever. When you get the worst news, when you get sick, when you have cancer, when the world is imploding on itself, God is in control. Amen. Christians must cling to that. Amen. Sometimes it's all you have in life. That's right. Amen. Men are fools. Amen. That is doctrine number two. So as we look at this prophecy and we consider the various implications or how it could play out. Now listen, somebody in this church has posted something on Facebook sometime or another about how we're all going to get turned into 5G towers. Now listen, if y'all want to believe that, fine. But I'd ask you to step back and say, does it really make sense? I know half of you have seen that. Some people have sent it to me. I don't think that's what's going to happen. 
Could I be wrong about that? Yeah. Uh, some of y'all are more confused now than ever. I apologize for that. <laughs> Don't go watch that video. The point is, people always miss the prophetic meaning. We miss it. What we know is sure is what God has written. Amen. The details, the part we fill with our mind, we so often miss. If you allow me to, I'll fill in some that you would do now. Some things that you might guess based off what we're going through now. And I'm not telling you this is what's going to happen. I'm going to give you this as an example. Because I can only imagine what was spoken out of pulpits when World War I hit. Yeah. Or when the plague killed one-third of all Europe. They had to think it was the last days. This is it. The judgment of God has come on all the earth. Or World War II. Or when any number of uh, great earthquakes or fires or volcanoes have happened. Did the pulpits not sound, this is probably it. I don't know, I wasn't there, but I have to imagine so. And we can do the same thing. And, uh, hey, we, maybe this is it. But I'm going to offer you, uh, again, this as an example. I'm not saying this is it. I'm just, I want you to know that men are fooled. We always miss the point. Amen. Right now, there's a virus going around that has approximately a, th a 0.3% fatality rate. That's with them cooking the books on it. Now, I'm not telling you it's fake. If you think it is, you can ask some of our members here, all right? But it, it, it nevertheless, is not that dangerous. It, does, it is particularly harmful to the aged and those that have some sort of pre-existing infirmity. In other words, the virus itself doesn't seem to be strong enough to kill most people. I do not say that without compassion to those that have lost loved ones from this virus. Just like I don't talk about vehicles and automobile accidents without compassion for those of us that have lost loved ones. It happens. There are many ways that people die. And I'm compassionate to all of them. Nevertheless, this virus is going around, and it is the smallest of things. Many more people die in automobile accidents than this virus has killed. But big government has swept in and told people where they can and can't go and when. They've sent people home from work. Unemployment means people are more dependent upon the government. It means that people are more impoverished. Some businesses are no longer accepting cash under the guise of uh, being safer while you swipe your debit card debit card and punch all the numbers that everybody else touches and then you go out and pull your mask up touching your face yeah. listen to me now some businesses won't let you come in without your mask this is, this is a certain type of a mark I'm not saying it's the mark of the beast don't misunderstand me listen people almost are policing others I had a, a, a family member tell me that I don't love people if I don't wear a mask well <laughs> That's true if I have the same presuppositional beliefs that he does, yeah. but I don't. Amen. I believe something else. I'm not going to get into that right now. But some people believe that if you don't wear a mask, that if you don't care about this virus that you can't see, which, by the way, is smaller than the pores in a mask. You turn on the news every day. I'm talking about church people, and you eat up everything that they're throwing at you. Sometimes you sit there and say, okay, I'm not going to listen to it all. I'm just going to see what's going on. And then you put that crap in your eyes and in your ears every single day. It is affecting you. Every single day. So we're looking at a cashless society. No cash means you can't sell puppies to make money on the side. It means you can't cut your neighbor's grass. It means that the month that you come up short, you need to make a little... You cannot do any of that. Every transaction is traceable. Do you understand this means that somebody is in charge of your money and it's not you? And then you go and you belittle your neighbor for not following the rules, whether you're a no-masker or a master. And we've divided churches and families and houses and countries and towns. And by the way, what does a mask do? It covers your face. Now listen, don't talk about taking your mask off. I'm not talking what I'm saying. If you want to wear a mask, you wear a mask. Amen. But it covers your face. And you know that your face is unique as a, as a fingerprint. Uh, maybe in the case of identical tw twins, we can come up with an exception. Your face is your identity. It's your humanity. Wow. You can speak to me when you see me out in town. I'm going to tell you what. Most of you, I wouldn't know you if I saw you. Because we look at faces. Yeah. Your face, you know, it even conveys the emotions that are written on your heart. I can't wow. see your heart. But if you're happy or you're sad, I can tell it by your face. It hides your identity. You know what your identity is? Crooks have always worn masks. Now, you want to know why people are tearing down statues and burning businesses and running the streets like crazy? It's because they can do it with total anonymity. Is that what I meant to say? What's that word? Anonymity. anonymity. 
Now listen, <laughs> it goes both ways. I saw a video of some masked bandits beating a lady who stood in front of her building while she wore a mask. But you know why she was wearing that mask? They didn't have to look at her wince and pain. They didn't have to look on her humanity. So what does this do? It uh, sets us up in a situation where war can run the streets, where people are scared to death, don't know what to do. It dehumanizes us as we hide ourselves. And then there's the virus, the thing that makes you need your white horse savior. So here he comes with his vaccine. And by the way, if he comes out of Turkey or Dubai or somewhere like that in the Middle East, do not take his vaccine. We'll get to that later. Uh, now, some of you have been taking vaccines your whole life. I know because I'm one of them. I'm pumped full of so many vaccines, I couldn't name them all. They're on multiple sheets. The last time I took vaccines, I got sick as a dog. I said, no more. But you know, my work required me to do it. Many of you are in that same boat. And so he comes along with his vaccine, and it requires a marker, his marker. And the number is 6, 6, and 6. What does that mean? It doesn't matter. It just refers to the number of man. And we'll unfold all this later. But the point is that the world is right, as it always has been, for your Savior type to come in. And to say, here, take my vaccine, take your microchip. If you want to buy, sell, or trade, you need it. You have to take the mark. You want to vote, take the mark. You want to go to Walmart, take the mark. Now, does that sound unreasonable? Does that sound crazy? Maybe, but some of y'all don't listen to the one about becoming 5G towers. Now, I'm just putting this out there as an example of one way you could view it through today's lens. Do I believe that to be the case? No, I can't say that I do. But if it could be a precursor of things to come. All right? This could be softening the world up of things to come. I think that is probably much more likely. In the book of Daniel, and I know I'm out of time. I'll wrap up very soon. It says of the Antichrist that through his policy, can I say through his politics that he enacts, he shall cause the craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. Uh, and by peace shall destroy many. See, there it is, by peace. He's doing a good thing. Whatever he does, it's good. That's why people are going to follow after him. Because it's a good thing. He's saving your life. He's making you live longer. He's making you healthier. He's making you prosperous. What in the world is the craft? Well, this speaks of deceitfulness, of deceiving, of tricking people. And the Antichrist is the best trickster, or maybe I should say the worst trickster that the world will have ever seen. In Revelations 18 and 23, it says... Speaking to him, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. That word sorceries, you think of witchcraft and things like that. That word is pharmakia. And I heard one of these crazy internet theologians point that out one time, and I thought, well, how in the world is Big Pharma going to play a role in end-time prophecy? Does it mean that they're going to legalize drugs and people are just going to be crazy on it? Pharmakia. That sounds a whole lot like people that can make a vaccine by the, by the sorceries and the see many. Again, I, uh, just to be clear, y'all can fire me if you want to. I told you I work for God. But listen, I didn't say that that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I just want you to know that we are told in the scriptures to be watchful. Amen. We are to watch. Jesus says that those that don't are fools. And I told you, we always miss the prophecy. Do you know that when Jesus rose from the dead, he came back and he talked to his own disciples. He called them fools of heart, slow of heart. Yeah. How can you have missed it? Now, some of us just go through life. I've got to work. I've got to take care of my family. I've got to cut the grass. I've got to go to the beach. All these things to do, and I don't watch. But Jesus Christ says to watch. Be on the lookout for the things that are coming. Now listen, this is a, uh, some pretty terrible and scary stuff. But to be watchful, how do you do it? Let me give you a little help. Read your Bible. Hey. Some of you are going to draw some wrong conclusions. And I hope that when we come back here and gather together as God's church, we clear some of those up. Or maybe you'll call somebody. Y'all probably all call me this evening. Don't call me today. I got stuff to do. I got to listen. You've got Daniel. You've got the Sermon on the Mount. You've got Zechariah. You've got Joel, Amos, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. The great day of the wrath of God that's coming is in all of them. Now listen. The church 
And I'm going to present next time why I believe we'll be raptured out before this happens. But no matter what, even if I'm wrong about that, be fearless. That's right. Be fearless. He says, fear not. This is what Christ spoke to the church, not to the lost and dying world, but to his own. Fear not. And this is the last thing that I'm going to leave you with. And by the way, fearlessness in this day and age is seen by the world as foolishness. And sometimes i got to ask myself that. I think, am I crazy? And I feel awful alone when I, when I do things. I think, why don't people do this? You know what? If you can be fearless in this day and age, not afraid of your government, not afraid of your neighbor, then it is by grace. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe it's because you have a certain assurance in Christ Jesus. You believe his word. You want to know who was fearless? Caleb and Joshua. You know, the spies were sent into the promised land, and they came back. There was one from each tribe, and ten of them said, we can't do it. And by the way, that's a negative report. It's a false report. It's a bad report, the Bible says. And guess what? The people believed it. I want to submit to you that the same thing happens today, that people believe a bad report. We watch so much TV, and we listen to so much music, and there's so much in pop culture that is drama, excitement, drama, fear, cook you up. And your emotions are so easily excited that you just jump right on the first thing that just tickles your ears. But Caleb and Joshua said, God said, we can do this. If we be with him, he be with us. And I want you to know that because the people believed the wrong message, they had to stay in the wilderness. And it says that their carcasses fell in the wilderness. But the day came, many years later, 40 years later, and guess what? Somebody got to go into the promised land. And you know what old Caleb said? He said, I am strong this day as I was then to take it. To take that which God has given me. You see, he wasn't afraid then and he wasn't afraid when he was older. Now there are some people that will tell you that the closer you get to death, the more that you should fear. It reminds me of being a kid climbing that ladder to the high dive. You know some people, the closer they got to that top rung of, a, of the high dive, the more excited they got And other people. And by the way, that pictures the aged among us who though they get closer to death, they trust God even more. And you've been walking with Him longer. You've seen Him do more things. But some people, the closer they get, the more scared they get. And become such cowards that they will turn around and clear the entire ladder. And I'm talking about little boys. will climb down that thing, being made fun of and mocked by all their friends because they were too scared to do it. The church of Jesus Christ is no place for fear. Amen. In Revelation, it says that the fearful should not inherit the kingdom of God. We have got to stand up in a day and age when people are cowards. Amen. I know this. Another group that were fearless was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this goes right along with that song that we had this morning. We all go through things. And sometimes we have fires in our life. And when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were presented with the uh, opportunity to fall down and worship an antichrist type person, they said, no. And they said, our God can deliver us. But even if he won't, he won't. we're not going to bow down and worship. Amen. And they were cast into the fire. And it says that when they looked down in the fire, that they saw a fourth man, one like unto the Son of Man that was with them. Amen. And I want you to know that in the fires of the life, the church has got Jesus Christ in them. Amen. No matter what. And guess what? The fire didn't hurt them. Where are such men in this day and age? Give me some men who know that Jesus is here. Amen. I'll walk through fire with Jesus Christ. The church is kept by people not to be judged. By people that have the blessed hope Amen. that Jesus Christ is king. That when you couldn't pay for your sins, he did. Amen. And we, as the church, must cling to that. Amen. You have so many voices that you have to listen to. Listen to the voice of truth. Amen. Listen to the voice of your Savior and his prophets and his apostles. Don't be surprised. Be watchful. For it will come as in the days of Noah. People will be carrying on. They'll be going about business eating and drinking, marrying, having children, going to the beach. It's going to be a surprise. Amen. 
I'm going to tell you what, there's at least one person in this building that will not be surprised. Some of you cannot be surprised with me because you watch, because you're, you're looking, and because you believe. Amen. I'll conclude with this. I want to encourage you to remember what it says in Ephesians. It says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Wake up. Watch. Pay attention. He's going to illumine your mind if you will but look, not to the news, but to Him. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Not wise according to the men of the earth, but according to God, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the scriptures that are here before us. And though we may not know all the details, we don't know if there will be vaccines or how, how these things will all work out. God, I just pray that the blessed assurance that is given to us through your word would fall on every heart that's here today that's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I pray, God, that we would trust you and that we would be so fearless or so fearful of God that we would not fear men. And so, God, we pray that you would be the one that helps us to gird up the loins of our mind, to think rightly, to think biblically, that while we are surrounded in this flesh that we wear, living in this world that is run by the devil himself, even if it be for a short time. That God, we are influenced by all of these things. And so we just we pray, God, for your protection upon this people. And God, for every burden that was mentioned here, we lift them up. Many of us have family members. We have little ones in our lives that we have deep concerns for, great hopes for. We know many that are sick, those that await uncertain results of tests, and those, Lord, that indeed are approaching their very last days. And God, we ask that you minister to all of these and to help us minister to, to them in the way that you would have us to. But we pray especially, oh God, that you would minister to us in the spiritual way, knowing that all these things will pass away. And God, if we could be so bold, we ask that you would take your divine hand and that you would shape us God, so often we as the church, we say, oh, I can do this, and I can do that, and I'm called to do this, but we cannot. We are weak, and we are nothing without you. So God, shape us and get glory from us. Use your church, and we'll glorify your son. We thank you for who you are, and it's in his name that we ask these things. I'm going to ask Miss Betty Sue to play a song.